There is only one presence and one power in the universe, and that is God the Omnipotent. Did any of you think you were having a deja vu since I just said that? <laughs> did you think I got mixed up and started this service all over again, maybe? Or did you think I confused my two jobs and thought that I was at school teaching where you have to repeat everything at least four times? <laughs> No, I repeated the opening statement again because that idea that we begin with every week, talking about the omnipotence and the omniscience and the omnipresence of the divine is so very central to the unity teachings. The idea that God is everywhere all the time, including in us, is absolutely crucial. What it means, of course, is that everything is divine, including us and everybody else too. But how do we take this idea out of the intellectual realm and truly experience the divine in this, our secular world in the West that we live in? One way to do that is what Unity co-founders Charles and Myrtle Fillmore called going into the silence, where we will more easily be able to feel our oneness with God. The Fillmores used to have a 9 p.m. hour of silence every single night. They said that this was a time when people could just sit down and actually experience the silence and what many call the higher realms a place where we resonate with the primal mind and each other, since we're all part of that prevailing presence. Today, we would probably call that resting in the silence meditation. So next time we start the service with there is only one power and one presence in the universe, and that is God the Omnipotent, three times now, think deeply deeply about what that means. To understand this unity truth is an example of what for, uh, Charles Fillmore called right understanding. And it is one of his 12 powers, the 12 powers of man, he calls them, or the 12 faculties of man that we need to develop in order to truly manifest our highest good. Fillmore said that as we align ourselves with God, that is, comply with divine law and therefore find total union with our indwelling spirit, we realize the divine within us and we start activating these 12 centers or these 12 powers of consciousness in us, which will help us live more fulfilled lives on a daily basis, thus practical Christianity. Fillmore referred to these faculties as the 12 powers because he said they were absolutely essential for, to develop those in order to be what he calls the perfect man. These 12 powers that we work on developing at Unity in a variety of ways that perhaps you're not always even conscious of are, as we've just said, spiritual understanding or wisdom, faith, good judgment or discrimination, will, love, imagination, zeal, strength, power, elimination, order, and regenerative life. Each one of these powers or faculties of man is worthy of many, many truth lessons. But I'd like to touch on them briefly today so that you'll have some understanding of the general principle because much that is taught or done around here in the classes and the study groups and the truth lessons and the counseling revolve around one or more of these centers, developing these faculties that will help us live better on many, many different levels. Fillmore said that we have been weakened by years and years of wrong thinking and that developing spiritual understanding or wisdom can reverse this. 
by regularly resting in the silence through stillness or meditation, we can experience our oneness with God. Just intellectually learning about it is not the same as really being and experiencing that oneness with the power through silence. But the starting point certainly has to be understanding that there is nothing but God in the universe. Another of the 12 powers or faculties is faith. Faith in God's law of love and total power. Faith that this love and justice in the universe work unceasingly in and through us to establish divine harmony and order. It was through their faith that people were healed by Jesus. Faith is the key element that enables us to accept the reality of the indwelling presence. And as we believe, so it will be in our lives. So it is manifested. It doesn't really take much faith because those who do have it, have a little, gain so much from it and because of it that their faith is soon validated in their lives and is transformed into absolute, solid, irrefutable knowledge. For example, if you've ever disliked someone and then forgiven them by understanding why they did what they did, you know beyond any doubt how freeing and peaceful it is. You rid yourself of a lot of crippling negativity. Soon you no longer need what we call faith about the power of forgiveness. You've experienced it for yourself. You've validated its healing power in your life. But in the beginning, we often need what Coleridge calls a willing suspension of disbelief. The same principle can be applied if your faith is shaken, as mine was when I studied in Paris in college. All the existential French literature, the theater of the absurd, my professors seemed to say that life was just empty of meaning. And I was young, I was impressionable. I guess it was pretty much like our secular society that we're all exposed to today in America in that regard. I'd always wanted to be a nun, but my faith was totally shaken big time by external influences. I remember the time that I prayed and I just told God that I could not intellectually believe in him anymore and that I didn't understand the Bible and all those contradictions and that this would be my last communication. <laughs> he, would, <laughs> he would have to help me understand if he was there over and out. And that was the way it was for a while. And God did help me. I never did regain my faith in fundamentalist Episcopalian religion or the God that I'd lost faith in. No, but I was given one that absolutely made sense, one that cleared up all the biblical contradictions and what I considered to be downright injustices. I got something bigger and better because somewhere in me, I must have had some kind of faith. What I'm saying is that even when your faith is challenged, keep the faith that what you have outgrown is only a temporary loss that can lead to amazing, bigger and better things. It really wasn't until I'd studied in India that I fully understood the meaning of spirituality and God, but that was all apparently God's plan for me to realize the essential unity of all religions. I'm from Shreveport. If people didn't believe like your church believed, they were going to hell. We all knew it. Keep the faith. Even when your faith is shaken, there is always another chapter and bigger and better levels of understanding. Another of the 12 powers or faculties is love. It is said that love has nine ingredients. Patience, love suffereth long. Kindness, and is kind. Generosity, love envieth not. Humility, love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Courtesy, seeketh not her own. 
good temper is not easily provoked. Guilelessness thinketh no evil. Sincerity rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Fillmore said that love is the power that moves the world and that the sooner we discover that and take advantage of it, the sooner we will have happiness, harmony, and prosperity on many, many levels in our lives. And remember that love of self, yourself, is essential. Be your own loving parent if need be, because you are the children of the divine. We didn't all have the loving, nurturing parents that we would like to have had, but we can lovingly parent ourselves. Another power is imagination. The imaginative faculty is extremely powerful because what a man can imagine, he can do. Through imagination and through imagining a possibility of something, Jesus quieted the storm. He imagined he could do that. He quieted the storm, remember, on the Sea of Galilee that was threatening to overturn the boat that was carrying him and his disciples. Metaphysically, this means that we can quiet the storms in our lives if we will just hold the thought that it is possible in our imagination. Fillmore wasn't talking about pointless daydreaming. That is ineffective. He's talking about conceptualizing what we want to manifest and then carrying the plan through. And that way we materialize on the physical plane the idea. The Bible doesn't say that Jesus just imagined that the waves were calmed. He ordered them to do so, and then they did. Calming the waves is symbolic of those things in our lives that we can dare to imagine and then order and then carry out. Fillmore says we mustn't allow ourselves to form pictures in our minds of doubt, fears, or contrary forms. In our inner world of thought, we imagine or fashion the perfect picture of what is needed and wanted, and then we have the patience until the formative power of thought has produced the result that is held in our minds. Probably most great inventions were brought about by first imagining that they were possible. Another power or faculty is will. If we strengthen our volition to choose what is right for us, and if we don't let ourselves be tossed around by every whim and societal influence that causes us to stray off of our chosen path, we will be free. We can either live on the animal plane by our instincts and suffer due to the chaos that we often create, or we can live on the spiritual plane and enjoy all of the benefits and freedom of the higher levels of reality. And we all know that this often takes great will. Another power is power. Fillmore felt that we have no idea how much power we have because we have access to all that God is. We just need to stay aware of that all the time. We need to direct our thinking. We need to be careful not to allow ourselves to form pictures of lack and doubts and fears or contrary forms. After we've imagined the perfect picture of what's needed and wanted, we need to ask for the power to see it through. And we need to maintain patience until the formative power of thought produces the result we want despite occasional setbacks. That's normal. The same is true of the seventh power, strength. Not just physical strength, but mental and spiritual strength in manifesting and practicing regularly this inner strength of God. It's sort of like working out. The potential muscles are already there, but they have to be developed. We must work out spiritually too to develop our spiritual muscles. For example, forgiving, loving, not allowing negativity in our lives. Old boundaries will just disappear, 
and we will have new avenues open up that are better than anything we could possibly imagine. When we build up our muscles, like the heart muscle, we can run marathons. The same goes with developing spiritual strength. Walk the talk and develop yourself. The eighth power is elimination or renunciation. This takes discipline and practice because it entails getting rid of all kinds of offensive thoughts or conditions, letting go of them so that we can take on the new and the desirable in our lives. For example, we might want to eliminate our false personalities and take on a more Christ-like essence. We call that uh, letting go of our egos in A Course of Miracles. Or we may want to quit blaming others and the world for our problems. Just renounce it. We may want to renounce physical things that are impeding our growth, like maybe alcohol, caffeine, meat, sugar, lack of exercise. Whatever we feel in our hearts is affecting adversely our physical temples and thus our lives. A diabetic, for example, would renounce sugar, an alcoholic alcohol. I certainly feel better and have more energy since I've renounced all of those things. I'll tackle the exercise thing uh, manana. Bottom line, <laughs> renunciation, which at first may seem like a sacrifice, brings gifts that far, far exceed what we have renounced. Another power is order basically spiritual law and order that establishes order in all things, in all areas of our lives. When our outer lives correspond with our spiritual inner lives, there is order. When Jesus got rid of the thieves and money changers, remember in the temple, he was creating order. The temple is our personal inner temple and the thieves and money changers represent the parts of us that steal our peace and turn us into something worldly and apart from what we can be. We need to be vigilant like our own little inner policeman that we are living in a way that is conducive to spiritual growth. Only we can maintain this order in our lives, inner and outer. The tenth power is zeal, the affirmative impulse to go forward no matter what. Many fail, Fillmore says, because they are not patient and they just give up. They give in to setbacks or their personal doubts or they're just plain impatient. Spiritual success takes time. We can't expect our ideas to be transformed all at once. We must be receptive to the divine and then await the results of our renewed thoughts and actions. Wait for them to manifest in our lives. Fillmore felt that mankind's weakened condition caused by generations of men and women who thought negatively and lacked spiritual understanding made it really unrealistic to expect immediate results in developing the 12 powers. Gurdjieff used to say, you had to understand something for two years in yourself before it would start manifesting in the out external world, your world. Success will come, however, to those who are zealous enough to keep practicing in spite of apparent failure. Two steps forward and one back is still progress. The eleventh power is life. Fillmore said that as we can create a new life in us, our bodies, our external bodies, will be transformed within and without. When we realize that we are perfect, unchanging, and eternal, we will manifest that in all ways, including living eternally. The last power is judgment. We must let there be light in our minds and hearts. This light will stay focused on the right path so that we can be discriminating about what we need to do and then stay on that path. 
We can't serve God and mammon. We can't keep our feet in two different worlds and get very far. We can't steal on Fridays, repent at confession on Saturdays, and then expect to be the kind of people who will gain much from a truth lesson on Sundays. We need to maintain good judgment at all times if we truly want to transform our lives. We all know what good judgment is, but we need to be present at all times and remember to use it in every situation. You can make a decision in one second to borrow a lot of money from a bank that you could spend your whole life paying back, for example must use good judgment and be discriminating. And above all, we must be the righteous judge who bans those money changers and thieves from our personal temple. When Jesus had become the Christ, he called his 12 disciples to him. Metaphysically, this means that when a man has become more than his personal ego, when he becomes his spiritual consciousness, he begins to train deeper and larger powers within him, his disciples, so to speak. He sends his thought down into his inner centers and brings them to life. Fillmore says that this is the second coming of Christ in us. It's the awakening and the regeneration of the subconscious mind through the superconscious mind or Christ mind. We become activated as the Christ. And that is when spiritual evolution really begins on its most profound level. Scripture symbology calls the 12 parts of man's consciousness his 12 disciples, whom he must teach, lead, and help transform into something higher a superman, if you will, the Christ. The disciple Peter represents faith, our inner faith, the rock on which our church is built. Andrew represents our inner strength. James is our discriminative power or judgment. John is love. Philip is power. Bartholomew is imagination. Thomas is understanding. Matthew is will, James is order, Simon is zeal, Thaddeus is renunciation, and Judas is life. Thus we have our 12 disciples, faculties, or inner powers in us that we need to develop in order to manifest our truly highest possible good. The wonderful thing about this quest is that there are many on this path around here. And it is a joyful, peaceful, and rewarding path, full of miracles, love, support, and fulfillment. And God willing, it will get better every day. Everything that we do, every class, every service, every encounter around here, whether you fully realize it or not, it's part of the curriculum of developing one of these 12 powers in us. I hope that you will join us in officially joining uh, us next Sunday and becoming an official member of Unity of New Orleans and 